for those of you who are new, welcome to my channel. My name is Brianna, aka Dollface PA. For those of you who are returning, welcome back. Thank you for joining and thank you for watching with me. I do want to apologize for the brief delay that I've had in putting out new content. I've been extremely busy lately. I actually just moved. And of course, in addition to that, I've been working like crazy. And so forgive me, but I am back today. And today's topic is going to be something that's been highly requested by a lot of my subscribers. And that is talking about clinical rotations. I get a lot of questions about like, what is the best way to prepare? Like, what advice do you have? What tips do you have, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna go through all of that today. So stay tuned. So I first wanna start out by just saying that clinical rotations are so much fun. I know that when you're in PA school, as you're nearing the end of the didactic portion of the program, it is very nerve wracking and very anxiety provoking. You're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm getting ready to go out on clinical rotations. Am I ready? What if I mess up? Do not be fearful. It's totally normal to have nerves, but know that you are, they understand that you're a student, so they don't expect you to know everything. Go into it with an open mind and an open heart, understanding that it is going to be a learning opportunity. You're going to learn so much. You're going to see so much. And ultimately, it's going to be a preview into what your duties and responsibilities will be when you're actually a practicing clinician in the field. So it is amazing. I love clinical rotations. They're so fun. Every program does it differently. But as I explained in one of my prior videos, we had core uh, rotations that we had to complete and then I got to choose two electives. And so, you know, clinical rotations are great because not only do you get the exposure and you learn a lot on clinical rotations, but there are also some potential job offers that lie in clinical rotations. So that's another thing to keep in mind. There were several of my rotations that at the end of the rotation, they offered me a job. And so, you know, you want to take it seriously. You want to be punctual. You want to be on time. You want to bring your A game and show them like, I am someone who could potentially be an employee here. Like I have what it takes. I'm a hard worker. You want to bring that work ethic and you just want to show them that you are capable and able, even if it's a rotation you're totally not interested in. So for example, I absolutely hated pediatrics and that is a core rotation. Love kids, but I hated pediatrics. I could not see another otitis media, couldn't do it. And regardless of how you feel towards the field, you want to approach every rotation like you're trying to get a job. You want to approach every rotation like you're trying to get a job because if you are showing up every day and putting forth the effort like you want to work there, you will exude excellence and your preceptors will notice it and ultimately that is how they will grade you because you do get a grade to some extent for clinical rotations well there's evaluations and things of that sort i think it varies from program to program whether that actually correlates to like a actual grade or if it's just kind of like pass fail but either way you want to make a lasting impression with your preceptors so that would be tip number one always show up like you're trying to get a job there Every clinical rotation is essentially a job interview. So that's something to bear in mind. How to prepare. And so when we went through our medicine modules during the didactic year, they were broken up by body system. So we had cardiology, we had GI, we, had, we went through every body system, endocrine, renal, just like that. And we actually had a separate course that was our surgery course. So like when I went on my surgery rotation, I was able to reference the notes that I had kept in like the PowerPoints from the class surgery that I had taken during didactic. My advice would be to review any coursework and materials that you have from the particular subject that you are going into. So for example, my first rotation was surgery. So I just reviewed all of my surgery notes, my hand ties, things like that. Um, just so you do have some idea of what you're going in. So you don't want to show up to your first day of clinical rotations completely clueless. But at, at the same time, again, they do know that you're a student. And so they don't expect you to have it all together. Um, after that, I did 
family medicine, which is very, very all encompassing. So in a sense, I kind of just briefly went through all of my medicine notes. Um, then after medicine, I think I did pediatrics, which we did have a pediatrics module in medicine. So I went through and looked through those notes. And that is about as much preparation as I did for each clinical rotation, in all honesty. Um, when you show up to your first day of clinical rotations, like I said, of course you want to be punctual. Like I've always been told my whole life, early is on time, on time is late, late is unacceptable. So if you want to show, if, they, if the start time is 7.30, I would say to be there by 7.15 because there's nothing that puts a bad taste in a preceptor's mouth more than you showing up late. It just shows a lack of motivation, a lack of interest, a lack of ambition. So first and foremost, you want to show up on time. Secondly, I would really encourage that you manage expectations up front with your preceptor. And what I mean by that is just kind of get a feel for what is the rotation going to require of me? Am I going to be expected to carry patients on my own? Am I going to be expected to see patients on my own? Am I going to be expected to write notes? Am I going to be expected to present to my preceptor? And if yes, if, if you are expected to present to your preceptor, you should get a very clear understanding from your preceptor of how they would like to be presented to. Because I can tell you, even now working in internal medicine and working with several different attending physicians, every attending has their own style and their own preference. Some attendings want a very long and drawn out and detailed presentation. They want the HPI, the AMP, they, like they want all of that in a verbal presentation, whereas others are like, just hit the high points, keep it short and sweet and to the point. And it's very important to manage that up front because sometimes if you just go into it and give this over detailed verbal presentation, the attending may get a little snappy or annoyed with you because they're like, listen, we have way too many patients to see for you to be spending five minutes pre presenting on one patient. Whereas the flip side to that is if you do a presentation that's too short and you have a attending that is like, wait a minute, that was really, really abbreviated. Where's the rest of your presentation? That's why it's very important to manage this particular expectation up front. Secondly, you want to stand out. You want to shine. Come with your best attitude. You want to show ambition. You want to show interest, even in things that are not really interesting. You might have to fake it a little bit until you make it, but if a topic is brought up, it's wonderful to ask your preceptor like, hey, like, would you mind explaining to me how this works? Or I heard you mention this. Um, can you teach me a little bit more about that? Also, always accompanying that with, I'm going to go home and read about that tonight to learn a little bit more about it. But if you're able, do you have a moment to like just discuss this with me? I'm really interested in learning more about that. That type of ambition and that type of interest really, really goes far with your preceptors because it shows, wow, she's really motivated to learn. She's really motivated and um, she is showing that she has that self-directed learning because she hears a term that she's never heard before and says that she's going to go home and look it up, but is still asking me to aid that by having me explain it to her. That goes a very, very long way when, you're pre when your preceptors do your evaluations, trust me. Volunteer to do tasks. Um, let's keep it real. When you're a medical student or a PA student, you are at the bottom of the totem pole. So if there's anything that you can volunteer to do that is gonna make the lives of the PAs or the doctors that you're working with easier, volunteer to do it. Um, something as simple as taking some papers to the shred room or doing, if you hear them discussing something that needs to be done and it's something that may not even be medicine related, but you know that just by offering to help do it, it will make their job easy, volunteer to do it. They appreciate that. And any opportunity that you have to volunteer and helping making the day more streamlined and more effective in the way of patient care or in the way of improving the flow of the day, volunteer. In the same spirit of managing expectations, as I was just speaking about a minute ago, manage expectations in everything. Ask them, what am I expected to know as a student? And you know, I think honesty and transparency goes a very long way. A lot of the time they already know, but there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, this is my first rotation. Like, I really want to do a good job at this. What is expected of me in this regard? So for example, if you're expected to write notes, ask them. What, what exactly are you expecting 
or what is expected of me in these notes that I'm writing? Are you expected to do a full H&P? Are you just doing progress notes? These are very, very good things to ask. And I know, for example, sometimes they'll say like, oh, well, you're required to do two admissions. I would say to try to exceed that. Always try to exceed the expectation. Never do the bare minimum. So if they say, okay, you're on this six-week rotation. In the six weeks that you're here, you're required to do two admissions. I would say to aim for three. After you do your two admissions, maybe on another day where you see an opportunity to do another one, ask your preceptor like, hey, I know that the requirement is two and I know I've already done two, but this is a really interesting case and it seems like there's a really good opportunity here for learning. Would you be okay with me doing an additional one? That is how you go above and beyond and exceed the expectations of your preceptor. And these are the cases where they will be more likely to offer you a job after the fact. And I know that's not what it's all about because at the end of the day, you're really there to learn, but it also doesn't hurt when you have several job offers lined up when you finish rotations. So that's just a little caveat. Lastly, the end of rotation exams. And so at the end of all of your core rotations, the core rotations being psychiatry, family medicine, pediatrics, surgery, OBGYN, emergency medicine, internal medicine. How could I forget that? I work in internal medicine. And I believe those are the only course. You only have an end of rotation exam at the end of every core exam. And yes, you do have to pass them. So I get a lot of questions about what is the most effective way to prepare for an end of rotation exam. So the good thing about the core rotations is you've definitely had a module in your general medicine class during the didactic semester where you've covered whatever the core subject is at the end of the rotation is on. I would suggest going through all of those notes for that particular subject matter. So if you are having um, an end of rotation exam in pediatrics, go back, go through your pediatrics module from general medicine and just really study it. Secondly, you can use the study guides. They have several study guides on the PAEA online website and I'll link that down below. They have two. So they have the blueprint and they have the topic list. And I use this a lot to study for my end of rotation exams. So the blueprint really just breaks down how much of each organ system will be on each end of rotation exam. So for example, I found the blueprints to be very, very helpful in end of rotation exams that span over several different organ systems. For example, family medicine, emergency medicine, internal medicine. Those are not specialist fields. Those are very generalist fields. So for example, for the blueprint list for emergency medicine, it would tell you 17% is on cardiovascular, 13% is on pulmonology, 4% is on orthopedics. And I'm making these numbers up, but I think that that was very helpful in guiding how much time I should spend on each subspecialty because it's very easy to feel lost on an emergency medicine end of rotation exam when you're trying to prepare because in your mind you're thinking like wow emergency medicine is so all-encompassing and it encompasses everything like where do I even start but that's a very good way to guide your efforts and to manage your time because if you know that cardiovascular is the heaviest and bulkiest portion of the test you can say okay I'm going to spend the majority of my time focus focusing on cardiology and kind of go from there. If you know that ENT is only 2%, maybe you won't spend as much time or effort doing that. So I definitely think that the blueprints are most helpful for the generalist end of rotation exams. Secondly, on the PAEA website, they have topic lists. So it will literally be like pediatrics and then what topics of the pediatrics module should you focus on. I found that that was very helpful in guiding me on what I should study. So for example, um, it would be like milestones. You know, baby should be doing this by three months, by six months. Or the vaccination schedule. At what age should the baby get this vaccination? And I would go back to my medicine notes and find those particular topics and like really hone in on studying those. That helps me as well. And I passed all my end of rotation exams. So I mean, that's 
just kind of one method that you can use to be successful in um, passing your end of rotation exams. Personally, I felt like the tests that we took during the didactic year were much more difficult than the end of rotation exams. So if you made it to didactic, I'm sorry, if you made it to clinicals and you pass all of your didactic tests, you will likely be okay with end of rotation, but you do have to study for them. I don't want to make it seem like you can just go to the rotation and show up the day of the end of rotation exam and think you're going to pass it. You do still have to study, but I personally don't think that it required the amount of effort, focus, and like determination and grit that didactic did. So that's a bit of encouraging news. I guess in a sense, it does get easier. But regardless, you can do it. Go out there, kill it, make a name for yourself, make a name for your school. It used to be so, it used to make me feel so good when I would be on rotations. And like, because the preceptors are so impressed, they're just like, what school did you come from? And I'm like, I went to EVMS. It's like, you're putting on for yourself, you're putting on for your school, and it really just makes you feel really good and it makes you know that everything that you worked so hard for in didactic was not for nothing. Like, it does matter. The knowledge will show back up when it matters and it's amazing to be able to finally get to interact with real patients and this is what we do it for. And so if you guys have any other questions at all, please do not hesitate to contact me. I can be reached on Instagram, Twitter, or you can email me as always. Everything is down below in the details box. I love you guys and I will see you guys soon. Y'all be safe. Take care of yourself. Love you. Bye.